No, you won't. Okay, first thing I want to tell you today is that there is no children's church. I think I heard that today. There's no children's church. I'm just going to walk around, so I do that all the time. <laughs> Another thing is I, I have some exciting news. Next Sunday, we will have Vicar Jim Fitzgerald. He will preach for us, and he is our potential new pastor. Okay, so he will be here. At 9 a.m. we'll have a breakfast. Okay, breakfast will be from 9 to 10. Um, he has a family, his wife, his daughter. I'm going to say this wrong. Eden? Eden. Eden, okay, that's close. Eden. Okay, we'll be here. We'll have breakfast. You can ask him questions, but I want you to meet his family and to meet him. So he will lead service, and then we will have a meeting. So we have to have a forum, and then we will have a meeting, and we will have a vote to see if he will be our new pastor. Okay, so that is next Sunday, breakfast at 9. He will lead worship. Afterwards, we will have a meeting, and we will vote to see if he will be our new pastor. Yes? May I just add something? Since I'm head of the Socialist Meals Committee, if you would see me after church today, if you are willing or able to bring some sort of breakfast munchie, uh, we're not having casseroles or anything like that, just sweets, bagels, donuts, something light like that. If you would see me and I'll sign you up, I would appreciate it. Thank you. And my wife told me something. We will have no communion next Sunday. Okay? So when you meet him, feel free to ask questions. I want you to get to know him before he preaches next Sunday. Anybody have any questions? Am I missing anything? Okay. We're okay. We're okay. Okay, just give me a quick background. We could be here until after 11, but I promise I'll keep it short. Uh, the call committee, we interviewed him. We went to the camps for he led a Bible study. Uh, we interviewed him, I think, like three hours. It, it seemed like forever. And then we brought him to the council. The council interviewed him. We took a vote. And now, next Sunday, we will present Jim Fitzgerald. Okay? Any questions? Awesome. Thank you very much. I have an announcement. Good. Okay. Okay. So, I have awesome news. As you know, since the uh, since December, we haven't the last two sections of distribution was December because of the, we used to be the Perry County uh, Food Bank and no longer brought us um, food. But I was able to um, work out something with the Board of Life and starting next month we're going to have our food distribution again. So we'll be giving out boxes. We're still going to do all our health and media days. We'll have boxes and we'll have extra things for the people and um, actually uh, the food bank taking out the huge freezer that we have, but we're actually going to be able to get some frozen and fresh things from Bread of Life. So what I really want to do is buy a new freezer. Maybe we can get a scratch and dent or something. So if anybody feels so inclined to give a donation that we can start a little fun, um, you know, if everybody, if everybody would give, you know, a couple bucks, we could, we could actually afford to get a new freezer. Because I'd like to be able to get some frozen food. When I was over there, they had like frozen ham steaks and a whole bunch of different things that we were able to get. So, and we really did have a need. I mean, because even um, yesterday when people were here, they were able to go. People, some people, we had some free things that I got from Bread of Life, but we had people go back to our pantry, and a lot of people, you know, were just very thankful. I mean, because some of them, they go. Um, qualify to get some food stamps. Like, for an example, there's this one woman that she babysits her grandkids all the time, but she, it costs a lot to feed them lunch and stuff, so she comes back and she gets, like, the canned pasta. And I'll tell you what, everybody loves spam. We go through so much spam. But anyway, I just want to
This is the third Sunday after Pentecost. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Blessed be the Holy Trinity, one God, who greets us in this and every season, whose word never fails, and whose promise is sure. Amen. Let us confess our sin in the presence of God and of, our, and of one another. Merciful God, we confess that we have sinned. We have hurt our communities. We have squandered your blessings. We have hoarded your bounty. In the name of Jesus, forgive us and grant us your mercy. Righteous God, we confess that we have sinned. We have failed to be honest. We have lacked the courage to speak. We have spoken falsely. In the name of Jesus, forgive us and grant us your mercy. God is a cup of cold water when we thirst. God offers boundless grace when we fail. Receive the gift of God's mercy, for we are freed and forgiven in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen.
grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with all of you. And also with you. And let us pray. O God of compassion, you have opened the way for us and you have brought us to yourself. Pour your love into our hearts that overflowing with joy, we may freely share the blessings of your realm and faithfully proclaim the good news of your Son, Jesus Christ, our Savior and our Lord. Amen. The first lesson is taken from the 19th chapter of Exodus. The Israelites had journeyed from Rephidim, entered the wilderness of Sinai, and camped in the wilderness. Israel camped there in front of the mountain. Then Moses went up to God. The Lord called him from the mountain, saying, Thus you shall say to the house of Jacob and tell the Israelites, You have seen what I did to the Egyptians, and how I bore you on eagles' wings and brought you to myself. Now, therefore, if you obey my voice and keep my covenant, you shall be my treasured possession out of all the peoples. Indeed, the whole earth is mine, but you shall be for me a priestly kingdom and a holy nation. These are the words that you shall speak to the Israelites. So Moses came, summoned the elders of the people, and set before them, all these words that the Lord had commanded him. The people all answered as one, everything that the Lord has spoken, we will do. Here ends the first lesson. We will now read Psalm 100 responsibly by verse. Be joyful in the Lord, all you lands. Serve the Lord with gladness and come before his presence with the song. Enter his gates with thanksgiving, go into his courts with praise, give thanks to him and call upon his name. The second lesson is taken from the fifth chapter of Romans. Since we are justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ through whom we have obtained access to this grace in which we stand, and we boast in our hope of sharing the glory of God. And not only that, but we also boast in our sufferings, knowing that suffering produces endurance, and endurance produces character, and character produces hope. And hope does not disappoint us, because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit that has been given to us. For while we were still weak at the right time, Christ died for the ungodly. Indeed, rarely will anyone die for a righteous person, though perhaps for a good reason, someone might actually dare to die. But God proves his love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Here ends the second lesson. The Holy Gospel, according to St. Matthew, the ninth chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. Jesus went about all the cities and villages, teaching in their synagogues and proclaiming the good news of the kingdom and curing every disease and every sickness. 
When he saw the crowds, he had compassion for them because they were harassed and helpless, like sheep without a shepherd. Then he said to his disciples, the harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Therefore, ask the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. Then Jesus summoned his 12 disciples and gave them authority over unclean spirits to cast them out and to cure every disease and every sickness. These are the names of the 12 apostles. First, Simon, also known as Peter, and his brother Andrew, James, son of Zebedee, and his brother John, Philip and Bartholomew, Thomas and Matthew the tax collector, James, son of Alphaeus and Thaddeus, Simon the Canaanian, and Judas Iscariot, the one who betrayed him. These 12 Jesus sent out with the following instructions. Go nowhere among the Gentiles and enter no town of the Samaritans, but go rather to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. As you go, proclaim the good news. The kingdom of heaven has come near. Cure the sick, raise the dead, cleanse the lepers, cast out demons. You received without payment, give without payment. The Gospel of our Lord. Praise, Praise to you, O Christ. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and from our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. I was ordained in 1980, so call votes seem like a long time ago to me. Don't worry, I'm not going to start talking about my favorite color, places I visited, things I know or think I know, important people I may have met or not, my hobbies and other totally irrelevant stuff like that. For the sermon is not about the one who is preaching. And it is not about entertainment, much as we like that. It is to be for us, for the preacher as well, a proclamation of gospel. Whether or not you and I or anyone else want to focus on that right now, or at any other time, and whether or not we agree with or like the content of the gospel. Jesus said, the harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Therefore, ask the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. As Baby boomers age and retire. The church needs more pastors, even though congregations continue to close as the ELCA continues to shrink and apparently is likely to continue doing that. Ordained in 1980, I was educated to do ministry in a Lutheran church that no longer exists. And so for those of us persons who are still working at this, that's an argument for continuing education and for sabbaticals, but that conversation is for another occasion. Maybe your call committee has had that conversation. 
Our preaching must change for a new moment. Mostly, I think, that means that our preaching must get real. We do not live in a time or even a church of shared values, but rather of conflicting ones. There is little respect for authorities and institutions, including the church. Traditions and norms are cast aside merely because they are traditions and norms. There is little understanding of history, the history of the church, the history of the world, even the history of the United States. Because so much has changed, or at least appears to have changed, there is a sense that if something happened the day before yesterday, it's no longer important. It's no longer relevant. There is little or nothing to encourage reflection. The pace is simply too fast for that. There's great pressure to keep busy. There are so many appointments to keep, so many things to be done. Just don't stand there, do something. Don't be reflective, don't be intellectual, just be street smart. Tell us the truth, but not too much of that. Be smart, but not too smart. There is anxiety, even fear. What will happen next? There is the urgency of, and even the addiction to the phone, which has become one of our most necessary, even prized possessions. But you could have mine if you wanted, because I don't like the thing. Preachers must preach with knowledge and understanding of the real world and how the world we live in came to be the real world. We should have been doing that all along because the gospel of Jesus is always the same and it is always for the real world in every age. But we have too often spoken to congregations as if we were out of touch with reality and as if we were indeed running local social clubs, offering what has been referred to by a few of my colleagues as regular dinner parties, either at the altar or in the church basement or social hall, wherever that may be. And as I say these things to you this morning, I'm not trying to suggest to you that if preachers would preach the way I think they ought to do that, that everything would suddenly be wonderful. That, that people would come, that plates would be full, that the church would no longer look old, but rather young. This is not 1958. We're not going back there. We go forward, not knowing. And there are no guarantees. Preaching might be more faithful to the gospel of Jesus Christ. It might be more honest. It would offer no illusory hopes, no guarantees about results that cannot be guaranteed. It might say things we need to hear, even if we don't want to hear them. Supply preachers such as myself would not get out an old one out of the file and use it on every occasion that shows up. The sermon needs to be new every time, every place. And I will tell you from experience, ministry is not fun, even though there is joy in it. And I will tell you from experience that congregations are not happy families that they are not made up primarily of nuclear families anymore, 
with father, mother, children, maybe two children and a dog. It's not 1958. And I am not becoming a cranky older man. I am not here to lament that things are not like they used to be. I am not here to complain. I am not here to rant and rave about what I don't like in the current world. Some things were better in 1958, but some things are better in 2023. I am here, and you are here, to bear the compassion of Jesus Christ among this little segment of humanity gathered here in and as a congregation along Route 15, and of whom it could be said, as it could be said of people in every time and every place, that they were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. And by that, I don't mean that you have no pastor under call just now, or that Pastor Eckert's interim ministry is somehow lacking. I'm thinking beyond all that. I'm thinking about the situation and condition of humanity on a planet in distress, ecological and otherwise. I'm not being parochial. I'm looking at the big picture and taking a long view. For humanity, this is a new day, yet having a lot of characteristics of the old day. Sometimes the appointed readings in the lectionary leave us wondering after we hear them, where is the good news in all that? Well, that's not the case on this third Sunday after Pentecost. For in Matthew's gospel, Jesus says plainly that the good news is that the kingdom of heaven has come near. I take that to mean near, not here, or now and yet, not yet, or here, but not fully here. I like that last one best, here, but not fully here, because who with straight face would call the world as we know it the kingdom of heaven? It's also good news that Matthew could write that Jesus had compassion for them rather than disillusionment and disgust sufficient to reject them. For them will prove to be humanity itself, not merely a small group of groupies or even 144,000 of them, which means that Jesus has compassion for ones who have not received compassion from us. Who might they be? We need to think about that and do some things differently before it's too late for the ELCA and for our personal relationships or even for society in general. It's also good news that Jesus' compassion is such that while we still were sinners, Christ died for us. Or maybe while humanity was not lovable at all, Jesus loved humanity anyway. And those of you who have loved or who do love ones who are unlovable will understand this. For Jesus loves us overcome as we are by sin and death and evil and unbelief. It is good news that Jesus notices a harvest. And given Jesus' analogy in the text, we might think of a field of standing grain ready to be gathered, but Jesus is thinking of humanity overcome by sin and death and evil and unbelief. The goal, so to speak, is to gather humanity into the very light of the Trinity of Father, Son, Holy Spirit, which is a community of love. And Jesus continues to look for ones to work with humanity, ones to be the compassion of Jesus in the real world, where the compassion of Jesus is not violence or threat 
or bullying or argument or magnetic personality or manipulation or abuse or spiritual stunt or cleverness or bargain. The compassion of Jesus is none of that stuff. The compassion of Jesus is not shooting up the place with a gun. The compassion of Jesus is accompanying humanity, among whom are people we probably don't like and who don't like us. It is walking humbly with humanity in humanity's real world, bearing a cross, a towel, and a basin, and trusting the Holy Spirit to work in God's time, even though humanity's boat appears to be sinking with all aboard right now. The compassion of Jesus is us accompanying humanity, walking with humanity while bearing a towel, a basin, and a cross, trusting God in such a way that we do not need to see immediate measurable, sustainable results, nor to try to force them. You will remember, maybe, that at age 75, Abram went out having no idea what lay ahead, except a general promise from God, it's all going to be okay. That's, that's kind of what we have, too. It's all going to be okay, but there's no map. It's all going to be okay. Trust the God who gives life to the dead and calls into existence those things that do not exist. The compassion of Jesus happens when we are trusting God, not escaping or trying to escape the world and not checking out. You're on a major highway here. You are on the real world goes by all the time, both directions. The times we are in are impatient, anxious, even fearful. The gospel is about the compassion of Jesus Christ, who walks with us and urges us to walk with one another, who comes to us while we were still sinners, while we were dying, while we were afflicted by evil, while we are tempted to unbelief. It is a new day, having many characteristics of the old day, and Jesus looks upon humanity with a compassion not to be taken for granted in the real world. Thanks be to God. Amen.
And so we confess the faith of the church. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead and his kingdom. Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Trusting in God's abundant mercy, let us offer our prayers for a world in need. Gracious God, we pray to you for the church here and wherever else it gathers all around the world. As you continue to seek out laborers to go into your harvest, ordaining some of them, baptizing all of them, so that those who sit in darkness in the valley of the shadow of death may hear good news finally, may receive healing that takes away their pain and that counters the forces of evil that prey upon humanity day and night. O oh God, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Gracious God, we offer you thanksgiving for the creation itself, for the planet itself, for the beauty and color of flowers and trees and for crops that grow. We pray for those who work to provide food for humanity. We pray for those who then prepare it and serve it. We pray to you for the gift of rainfall, for sunshine, for the growth of food. We pray for those who work to harvest the produce of the fields. We pray to you forgiveness for humanity's abuse of the planet so that we breathe smoke and even see it. God, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Gracious God, we pray to you for those who govern. We know that some are elected. We know that some are appointed. We know that some of them take power and abuse it. We pray to you for leaders of nations, including our own, who are emotionally well, whose relationships with others are healthy, and who actually care for the people entrusted to their care, and who are able to bear responsibility for the benefit of all. Gracious God, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray to you for those who suffer, for those who suffer in silence, for those who feel helpless, for those who are alone, for those who are abandoned, for ones who are abused, for ones suffering from mental illness, from ones who are addicted to various things. We pray for the healing of the sick, a number of whom are known to us by name and are listed in our bulletin today, but countless others are unknown to us. 
we pray for them all. Gracious God, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray to you also for fathers and for father figures, that you would console all who long to be fathers and children estranged from their fathers, those who grieve the death of a father and fathers who have lost a child. Draw near to all for whom this day stirs up difficult emotions. O oh God, in your mercy, hear our prayer. And gracious God, we remember to you this congregation engaged in a call process which perhaps is about to end. We pray for careful discernment by the people who will vote. We pray for the one who comes for a trial sermon and for his family. We pray that you would help all of these people in any anxiety they have, that you help them to be your people in this place, in this world, in the real world and that you would bless them as they go forward into your future, knowing only that you are with them. Gracious God, in your mercy, hear our prayer. For all the saints, we give you thanks, praying that you would receive into your eternal care all those who have died, and that you would fill us with hope that does not disappoint. O oh God, in your mercy, hear our prayer. For into your hands, O oh Lord, we commend all for whom we pray, trusting in your mercy through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Amen. Friends of Jesus, the peace of the Lord, the risen Lord, be with you always. And also with you and let us share a sign of God's peace. away from your presence. 
field and forest, sea and sky, you are the giver of all good things. Sustain us with these gifts of your creation and multiply your graciousness in us that the world may be fed with your love. We ask this through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Lord, remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen. The Holy Trinity, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, who calls to us in all creation and speaks to us in the smallest seed, bless, keep, and sustain you now and in all that is to come. Amen.
goodness, to love kindness, and to walk humbly with God. Thanks be to God.